This is about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to the universe. I'm your host, Chance, and this recording is coming at you from the 24th of July, 2019, right at the start of Leo season. And it definitely feels like we've cranked up the fires on our psychological steam engines as we move towards the end of a heavy duty eclipse season and Mercury retrograde. And I'm really excited about the visionary veteran of a veterable information infinity that we're going to be conversing with today because our guest of the week is a being who truly understands the depths of complexity that we're faced with while piloting these genetically unique meat suits we each use. Sometimes the enormous scope of extracurricular knowledge, scientific statistics, and metaphysical mysticism that we're digging through can leave us feeling a bit lost especially when it comes to topics like dietary dogmas and the dilemmas of what to have for dinner. And those of us who have explored a variety of approaches to create total health optimization have found that sometimes things don't do for us what the label says they will, because each of our bodies are like alternative realities residing inside a never-ending spectrum of parallel universes that we know as other people. So balancing the mind-body connection has always been an important subject on this show ever since its inception. And with a little maturity, we all eventually realize that the limits to our creative capacities are dictated by the daily habits, dietary hangups, and energetic makeup of our physical forms. And of course, we all want to achieve limit break status and beat the final boss of the game of life, also known as the nine to five day job. And for most of our paths, getting over the hurdles to achieving personal sovereignty and freedom to express ourselves 24 seven requires every drop of juice we can squeeze out of ourselves. For these reasons and many more, I'm delighted to debut today's guest, David Krantz, an epigenetic coach who's an extreme example of the Renaissance Renaissance Man template. He's been a guest on many amazing shows like Third Eye Drops and The Positive Head, so I'm sure we're in for a delicious dialogue this time around. This is a guy who fully fits the description of a well-lived full-spectrum life, and I'm stoked to talk with him. David's background as an artist who personally hit the health wall and started feeling the fizzling out of his fire at a young age led him to begin building up his scientific knowledge to recreate his daily life and become an unstoppable force of expressing imagination and living more lucidly. David has such a passion for bringing his biohacking magic to the conscious creative community that after finding Interverse, he offered to speak with us and share his wisdom, which I really appreciate because I know the type of knowledge he has can be the key to the lock on your creative blocks. And if you stick around to the end of the show, you'll hear some fantastic original music that David produces under the name Few Texture, beats that are very much grounded in the very in the type of electronic festival music that many of us cherish. I've heard his stuff compared to Tipper, and I wouldn't argue that. So 
Check out View Texture on SoundCloud and find David's epigenetic coaching services at his website, david-kranz.com, both of which are linked in the show notes. And I do hope you check out his website because there's a ton of free information and videos there, including an interesting seminar on the genetics of cannabis and how it affects each of us differently. I've already been pretty long in the wind introducing him, and we've barely even scratched the surface of his incredible catalog of interests and skill sets, but I'm ready to do this thing, and I bet you are too. He's the DJ of genetics who helps you dance to the beat of your own diet and the visionary who assists your creation of higher vitality, and I couldn't be more glad he's here for a first-time visit to the show. David, my man, thanks for being with us, and welcome to the Interverse. Hey, thank you. That was by far the best introduction I've ever heard. <laughs> so thank you for, for, for saying all that. It's amazing. I'm super stoked to be here, super stoked to talk about all this stuff with, you know, an audience that is tuned in and tapped into the mind body connection and all of the, you know, more subtle things in life. Uh, so I'm really stoked to talk. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I felt like I had to ramp up the introduction to fit your profile. <laughs> so I want to start by talking about your history and how as a young person, you were so enthusiastic about creating art and music that you lost track of your health. I'm pretty sure there's people listening right now who've had that experience or having that experience right now. And I think hearing about your journey could be extremely illuminating for us. Yeah. So I'll kind of give you the the full story. And, you know, there's a lot of factors that led me to where I am now and definitely kind of living the creative late night lifestyle of someone who is being booked to play festivals and shows and, you know, just by nature of being a producer and DJ staying up until three or four in the morning sometimes before I could get back to sleep um, and having an irregular circadian rhythm wreaked its kind of havoc. Now, one of the more interesting things that I found through a lot of my research on epigenetics is that I think that I was actually kind of set up to have an abnormal stress response even before I was born. Like my, my mom's parents are Holocaust survivors and they were both in concentration camps. And there's a lot of really good research that shows that people that, especially on Holocaust survivors, they tend to have an abnormal stress response, children and grandchildren. And that's absolutely what I've experienced most of my life and have really been working since then to kind of retool the way my nervous system is wired to respond to stress in a healthier way. But I think that I kind of had the perfect storm of not paying attention to my health, kind of eating the whatever I want diet, staying up late, smoke weed all the time, which, you know, not saying there's anything wrong with, but for me, since kind of understanding how it really affects my body, you know, it wasn't helping me out. I'll say that. And then the other kind of piece that led to the, the perfect storm of meltdown was I found myself in this creative partnership, this business partnership that ended up being a very toxic relationship. I just didn't see the red flag warning signs of getting involved with a intimate creative partnership with someone that ended up having a lot of personal issues that they brought into it and kind of got dumped on me. And so just from a relationship stress level, that was like, the the match that lit the fire of like constantly having to you know talk someone down from being you know totally you know just seeing situations in a very one sided black and white kind of way and um, you kind of being in the middle of all that just constantly and so from the strip between the stress of that the uh, lack of really paying attention to my body you know like not really exercising not doing things that would have potentially prevented and kind of given me a better stress response, my body kind of shut down. And I ended up having to go take a, a nine to five job. Like you mentioned, that is kind of the, you know, every creative who's, who's on the path kind of worst nightmare. I ended up having to do that. It was, it was a cool job. I was working at a synthesizer company building synthesizers, which like of all the nine to five is pretty good, but I kind of had to take a step back and just be like, all right, I got to do something that is outside this realm and just, you know, get my feet back under me. And kind of while I was there, I was looking for basically anything I could to reorient my health and shift the way that my body was responding. And so I got really deep into the biohacking world and started listening to a lot of podcasts, you know, just looking at research. And I had never even heard the term biohacking before and, you know, just got sucked into it and realized, oh, wow, like, what I put in my body is actually making a difference in the way that I'm feeling. Like I had never really made that connection before. And once I started to really pay attention to the subtleties of how all these things were impacting me, it just sort of 
created an obsession for me, like in the same way that, you know, wanting to create all the layers in music and in my production was an obsession for a while. This sort of replaced it in a way where I was like, all right, I got to pay attention to how all these things are interacting and all this complexity and, you know, really got into tracking things and working on my own, you know, my own body and, and, did a lot of good work and kind of got myself back to a place where I could think straight, got myself out of that, that partnership and ended up, you know, just kind of being like, all right, reset time to start new. And then of course, synchronicity peeks its head in and goes, uh, Hey, there's actually something here for you. So I was working, uh, at the synthesizer company at Moog music in Asheville, North Carolina, where I live. And I was taking a walk on my lunch break. And there is a sign on the building next door that I strangely recognized and realized that the sign on the building next door was the exact same logo as one of my favorite podcasts that I'd been listening to. And I was like, wait a minute, for real? And yeah, so it turns out the doctor that was hosting this podcast, who was like one of the like best podcasts I found on any of this stuff. And he was very focused on epigenetics and genetic um, analysis. Uh, had an office next door. So I, I booked an appointment with them because I just wanted to do some blood work with them, kind of, you know, take my own health path a little step further and found out that his partner, um, his wife, who was a co owner of the clinic, was a peak performance specialist for the Air Force and was an audiologist and had built an experimental sound chamber in this building that um, they were looking for someone to develop programs for. And someone that had like kind of a basis in biohacking and neurophysiology as well as music production. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to do whatever I can possibly do to end up here and working with you guys. And so I did quit my job at the synth factory, kind of went out on a limb right around that same time, you know, about six months later, uh, that doctor, Dr. Dan Stickler started developing a training program for coaches and clinicians in terms of using genetics and epigenetics and his method that he kind of pioneered over the past six or seven years or so with clients. And he was really convinced that I would make a good coach because I had kind of gone through this process on my own. And he, he knew you know, that I had a pretty strong basis in understanding all this stuff. And I was kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Like I'm a musician and I, I, I was really skeptical at first, you know, but I ended up trusting him and kind of going through this training and really kind of up leveled my scientific knowledge and started working with clients on a coaching and, and biohacking level to help them reach optimal health. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how I got to where I am today between a, you know, kind of, shitty situation of finding myself totally burnt out and unable to function kind of by necessity, getting myself back to the place where I could act the way I wanted to and, and function the way I wanted to. And then just kind of synchronicity landing in my lap and saying, all right, well, here's the next step if you want to take it. That's how synchronicity works. It's like once you're already taking the right step, then it gives you more steps, right? But mm -hmm. whenever you just get in that rut of continuing the same lifestyle choices that are hurting you, essentially, it, synchronicity kind of, it doesn't totally go away, but it just kind of scales back. And it it's really more revolving around like, hey, you're distracted and you just stubbed your toe, that kind of synchronicity, almost like anti-synchronicity. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, still the, there's still the messages. They just come in a form that isn't so exciting and leading to growth. It's like, no, no, you need to wake up. Like, here's something you can pay attention to if you want to. Yeah, the path is always there, though. Uh, what was the name of the podcast that you're referring to? And do you have any other good starting points for people interested in biohacking from the ground level? Yeah, yeah. So that one was actually called Biohacking for Optimal Health uh, was the name of the podcast. Totally direct in what it was about. You know, I like a lot of Dave Asprey's stuff. The Bulletproof podcast has some really good stuff, especially the earlier episodes. Um, like up until episode maybe two to 300, you know, everything before then is like him just going through like, all right, who are the expert, experts I can talk to to talk about all the basics, all the steps that you need to start thinking about health and the idea of N equals one, which is basically this idea that, okay, in a scientific study, N is the number of people that are in the study. For you as an individual, what matters well, the only thing that matters is the N of one. You in your own study, being your own experiment, 
seeing what happens. So, you know, it, it's very similar to um, any type of practice that you engage in. You want to see, you know, what are the results from doing Tai Chi or meditation or taking psychedelics? What, are, what do you see in your life happen? Uh, the biohacking approach is, okay, well, let's start tracking this stuff. Let's actually keep track of it day to day and really see if we can use data, use a data-driven approach to re- refine the process even further. Because sometimes it's pretty hard to like remember what you did three months ago unless you have it written down. Three days ago? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, hey, I'm curious about what you think uh, around learning the science behind things. Like, Does exploring this stuff actually help you maintain your personal determination to make the positive lifestyle changes stick? Like having the knowledge, is that like a motivator? Yeah, I think it, I think it is. I think that it's, it's a constant uh, give and take between those two kind of sides of things where, you know, the initial motivation to want to stick to habits uh, is driven by the desire for change. And there is definitely a level of being educated about like, okay, what's possible here? You know, what does the research say? What other people's experience say about what's, you know, what you might be capable of if you were to stick to something. And I think that beginning to really see how, you know, the, the scientific data is supporting the idea that, okay, yeah, like you can make massive changes to your, to the, what you do in your life and see massive changes, uh, to your mind and body, like really understanding the science behind that. Yeah. It reinforces that sense of being capable. And furthermore, like when you have the information, um, like what I do for clients where I I really help them understand, okay, what software can we load onto the hardware of your body? That's going to be that's going to run right with your operating system. Like what's actually matched up with your body. Once you have that information, it's also kind of just, it's much easier to just do it because you don't have to second guess yourself so much. Like there's less, like if you're narrowing down all of the decisions that you might have to make to where you can just focus on a few decisions, it's much simpler to make them rather than just trying to figure out everything. And uh, you know, f- stay within the habit. It's just kind of, you got one thing to focus on with that. I like to say that your life is your greatest work of art because it's basically a masterpiece. I mean, and nothing else takes as long to complete in your life as your life, right? <laughs> so well, one of the things about creating itself that non-creatives get stuck on is making decisions. Like the actual decision of what color is this thing going to be? What am I actually going to draw? Or where do I start? Any of those questions can be like a wall to some individuals who don't frequently tap into their creative side. So I like what you're saying because you're basically describing creating the optimal life for yourself and making the optimal decisions at just the same way that you would if you were a master on the canvas. Oh yeah, no, you hit it right on the head there, and I, I think that that is—I mean, yeah, you are—you are speaking, you are speaking my language totally. Because so you can look at health as you know, you can look at all the scientific data, but that's not what creating good health is. That's just information. That's like knowing, um, you know, that a note on the keyboard is uh, four hundred and forty hertz, or the color of you know, uh, knowing like opposite colors on the color wheel. That's just like, just total basic like data in order to actually apply it. You actually have to learn a particular style. Like you learn your own health style in the same way that like, if you're going to create art, you're drawing on this sort of intuitive process and hard technical skill. And the marriage of both of those things is what makes great art. Like you don't just copy someone else's style. And it's the same exact thing when you're really trying to hone in on your health practices uh, and what you're doing to create, you know, optimal health. It's like you you can't really just follow someone else's routine. There's the process of understanding, okay, here's the technical underlying reasons for doing things. But then once you start to apply it, you have to kind of uh, you know incorporate it, get the feedback from how it looks on the canvas, and then you know, really begin to use your intuition in terms of how you combine those things together. And it's, I don't know, really exciting to get to work with other creative people that understand that from a coaching perspective, because it makes it much easier to, to kind of bring out that intuition. And it's like, 
you, you know, like a, a master painter or musician, like at a certain point, like they don't have to think about it. They just know that that looks good or, or that's the next thing that they want to combine in a certain way. And, you know, it's very similar with creating good health where like at a certain point, you've just internalized like, okay, these are the things I know makes me feel good. These are the things that I know I need to do when I wake up in the morning to feel good. And it's much easier to just consistently do that. Like you've already created the feedback loop between what you do and how you feel. And it's, it's just a much more natural process. Uh, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's flow state and the flow state that you're in generates more of a flow state. It's this wonderful positive feedback loop there. Absolutely. It's like the Taurus itself that on an energetic level, our bodies actually are. And that's that self-feeding Ouroboros type thing. You mentioned at the beginning, the creative relationship you had that was strained. And I remember you talking about on another show that I can't remember the name of it, but it was like an astrology podcast you were on. You were talking about how you ended up looking at the chart of this person, if this is the same situation I'm thinking of, and your mm -hmm. own chart and realizing, oh, I kind of see where there's clashing here. And without necessarily going into all that, it's just my way of pointing out that you're so multidisciplinary that you're looking at things on a metaphysical level too. I was wondering if for yourself anyway, do you explore medical astrology as a way of helping you pinpoint some things that are more tailored to yourself? Yeah, you know, I haven't really explored medical astrology too much. I'll tell you, I, I appreciate astrology and I really use it from more of a psychological perspective. Um, I really like it in terms of um, less predictive and more just being in relationship to different archetypes of consciousness um, and how you can utilize different planets and signs as uh, mirrors of all of these different facets of the way that the human psyche works. Um, and so, you know, I really haven't gotten into the medical astrology side of things, but it's probably something at some point that I'll, I'll get really curious about and, and delve into because, you know, I, you know, you mentioned the mind body connection in the beginning and there are so many things that, you know, on the outside, someone might attribute to like, oh, well, this person just changed their diet or supplements or, or that type of thing. If you were looking at me from the outside. But in terms of my own internal process, kind of throughout the past six years or so, kind of this time period I'm describing, you know, doing therapy and paying attention to my dreams and doing psychedelic work uh, has been absolutely just as impactful as all of the hard nutrition stuff. And both of those things reinforce and inform each other. And so I'm really into kind of looking at the, um, the relationship of what we, what I consider kind of the false dichotomy of the mind and the body. Absolutely. And the hardcore data, that's like where I'm most interested in exploring. Not that we need to go crunch any specific numbers or statistics here, but I would like you to introduce the concept of nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics mm -hmm. and why they, why do you say they're like an update to Ayurveda? I don't know if I said that right, <laughs> but you know, Eastern Indian um, yogic medicine practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the idea of Ayurvedic medicine um, is that that each person is different. And for a particular person's constitution, they're going to require different nutrition. They're going to require different uh, herbs and practices that are going to make them really function at the best they can. And, you know, this is a tradition that's been embedded in uh, Indian Ayurvedic uh, culture for you know, six, 7,000 years, really old tradition. And when you look at the effectiveness of it, it's pretty, pretty good. Now, nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics are sort of this modern development from Western science that has a tr really strong parallel to that same idea that you can't just prescribe the same food to one person and expect it to, you know, be healthy for this other person in the same way. And, you know, we've kind of evolved, at least in the cutting edge research field to really start taking that into account. And what nutrigenomics looks at is how your food um, changes the expression of your genes. And, and nutrigenetics is more looking at, uh, there's subtle distinction, but they're two slightly different fields. Um, nutrigenetics is looking at how you can eat to match your genes. And so to give you an idea, like 99.9% .9 of my DNA and your DNA is exactly the same. The 0.1% 
is what makes you have a different hair color than me, different eye color than me, uh, different skin tone. But it also impacts all of the little tiny biological processes, all of the neurochemistry, all of your hormones, all of these things in your body that are just kind of automatically happening. Um, those are all influenced by the way your DNA is patterned. But it's these very tiny little differences that really create those differences. And what we've done in the past um, you know, about 20 years since we mapped the human genome is start to identify all of these little places in the genetic code that create the most important differences from person to person. And we've identified certain ones that say, you know, are responsible for how you absorb or metabolize different nutrients from food or break down saturated fat transported around the body. Why some people get heart disease when they eat diets high in saturated fat and other people lose weight. Like we're starting to identify all these little pieces. And so what nutrigenetics says is, okay, now that we know all these little pieces, we can design diets and nutritional protocols and other individualized uh, ways of living for people that are actually really design designed to be matched up with their genes. And so, you know, why I say it's a more updated Ayurveda uh, is because it's looking at these, you know, similar, the similar mentality of, okay, we're all unique individuals. What's going to be the method for determining this? Well, the, the genetics is really precise. It's really nice. And there's actually some analyses of the Ayurvedic typing methods. Uh, they call the doshas, um, where they've gone back and looked at the genetics and how they correlate. And sure enough, they're like, the, it verifies that the dosha system is at least to some degree pretty accurate, which is, is pretty cool. Um, the genetics match up with it to a degree, you know, it's not 100% full on, like everything matches up perfectly, but it's strong enough to where it's like, okay, there's something, you know, considerably considerable there. But the genetics gives you a, like a, like a two or three level, I don't know, zoom in, in terms of really getting clear on, okay, what are these different metabolic pathways functioning like in your body? What, how much of this particular enzyme are you producing? What nutrients can you use to make more of that enzyme if you're likely to be deficient in it? What things can you do to improve detoxification? Or, um, you know, there, there's just so many different ways to look at it. And it really is kind of the future of looking at how you can optimize your health. And like you mentioned in the, in the intro there, you know, anyone that is, you know, trying to live a life where they're putting out creative work or they're doing something that allows them to live off the grid, not off the nine to five. Like, let's face it, this reality right now in this particular time is not set up to support those people. But if you can figure out the little hacks and ways to kind of like fit under the radar, like there's, there's ways to do it. I mean, you know, but having the, the most efficient vehicle and brain and ability to show up the way you want to think the way you want to think clearly have the clarity of mind and a body that's going to kind of take you there, I think is super important. And so the, the genetics looking at it, you know, on an individual level really gives you this roadmap to follow. And it kind of, like I mentioned before, takes out a lot of the decision fatigue that comes from all of the conflicting nutrition advice out there. And the, the conflicting advice exists because people get really attached to their one way of doing things because it works so well for them, for their body. And so you see people that really love the keto diet or really love you know, being a vegan or vegetarian or the paleo approach or all these different kinds of methods. And they, they fail to see that just because it works for them doesn't mean it is the answer. It's a answer. It's another tool that people can draw upon. But when you zoom out and look at the big picture, uh, you really got to take into account all these individual variations. And you know, I think that in 10, 20 years, we're going to see this understanding really start to filter into mainstream consciousness. Right now, it's still a lot just in the research world. Um, but the results that I'm seeing with clients and other, my colleagues who use this stuff, I mean, it's, uh, kind of next level. It sounds like it. Next level is what I was thinking actually, because for me to get to a level where I even had the energy to do the show while also supporting myself with other means, because obviously as soon as you start a creative project, you're not going to immediately start taking home a paycheck. 
the energy that that required, I had to clean up my diet. And to a degree, just getting off processed food, getting onto more whole foods or even going plant-based can have a lot of positive effects for people. But down the line, if something that you're doing is strictly ideologically based, and it might be a really good reason, ideologically speaking, like veganism or vegetarianism, if you are hurting your body in the long run, I think that in a sense, you're actually doing as much harm to the world as you're preventing because your personal light and your uniqueness and what you are here to share with the planet is so special and invaluable that if you're compromising that, it's like as bad as doing a bunch of environmental damage in a sense to the world. Like At least to me, I see it that way. So really the key is if you are very set to have a specific diet based on ideology, I think you need to really think about how much time and attention you're putting into that diet to ensure that it's going to work for you and you're not going to hurt yourself down the line and fall off a cliff that you didn't know you're walking towards. I'm speaking to myself right now. Like I'm pretty sure for me, the next level up, as you just said, is to start exploring this on a genetic level and seeing where that takes me. It's pretty exciting. So do clients that come to you need to already have their individual configuration figured out? Do you have any recommended sources for how to get your genetic profile that you think are pretty trustworthy? Yeah. Well, so j- just to back up there for a sec, I mean, I think that is just, right. You, you couldn't have said it better that if you are, you know, doing something that's ideologically based, but not necessarily aligned with what your body biologically needs uh, in the long run, you're probably going to do more harm than good. And yeah, take away the light that you have to share with the world to some degree. Now it's based in good intentions, and I think that, you know, say with a plant-based diet, there's almost always ways to use supplements or use herbs or other things that can, you know, make up for potential nutritional needs and understanding, you know, how your body is wired to have higher nutritional needs can really help offset that and prevent that, you know, uh, decline in the long run. And, you know, some people are actually very well suited for vegan and vegetarian diets. There's no question about that. But in terms of looking at where to get tested, so um, people don't need to have genetics already done before I work with them. I, I work with a company called Apiron, um, and we have our own genetic test. And I used to use 23andMe primarily. Uh, I've since stopped using them. I still can use the data if someone has like a 23andMe analysis, but we're just in terms of privacy concerns and data ownership. I'm so glad you're saying this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they are um, not the problem. They're probably not the best people right now to be handing over your genetic data to. And not that I think there's any real risk on a personal safety level or like insurance level or anything like that. It's just, I would much rather not have someone profit off of my um, genetic data for research and me not get a cut of it at least. This is like a really dark concept, but like, what if your genetic data was out there and some billionaire needed a kidney and you were in the hospital for something else and you just happened to have an accident in there and then your kidney came up for grabs, you know, like, I don't really think that's a scenario that happens in the real world. But when I use my imagination to think, well, what are the potential risks of this type of personal data being out there to the highest bidder, I'm like, well, it gets pretty dark pretty quick. And I'd rather not think about it. But yeah, just to reinforce what you said, it's way better that you've got your own company uh, helping you that's not your own company, but a company that's more, you know, safe, I, I should say that you vetted. Yeah, yeah. And what we do is we actually um, like the lab that we use is a private lab, and they actually never have access to your personal information. We store that on a separate server. And then when they get the genetic test kit, they actually only can identify the sample with a number, a random number that's on the vial. And then they do the analysis, send it to us back. We match it up uh, from our end with the with your information and the number. And uh, then we delete it after 60 days. So it's like we're doing everything we can to be able to get the health benefits out of this, but also reduce any of the risks in terms of data management and privacy. That's cool. You're keeping the IFSR on off of people. Yeah. <laughs> We talked about why diet and dogma don't mix in the real world a little bit, as you've said. But do you think there are some people who could actually never be fully healthy on certain diets, be it vegan, paleo, or carnivore, or whatever? 
Are you saying like people that just simply aren't suited to one of those diets or for people that need something else besides diet to really improve health? Uh, it's people who will never be fully suited to it. Like, are there people that even with supplementation probably don't have the genetics to be a vegan without complications eventually? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, very, very possibly. Research is still ongoing. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I'll tell you, so like the nutritional science is one of the most flaky scientific fields to be in. Like it, there's a lot of issues with it. And I I don't even have the full knowledge to, to tell you all the reasons why, but a lot of the study design is very poor for looking at the, what people are actually eating, what they're reporting they're eating. You know, it's, it's almost all reliant on self-reporting and you have this, this big gap in between research and what people are actually able to study in real people in terms of like theoretical research and real stuff. So a lot of, like I said, you know, this is the, the field has been revolutionized in the past 10 years by a lot of people that are doing the N of one studies, looking at just single case studies and going, okay, yeah, this person responded this way and that's unique. It's actually an outlier. Um, and that stuff right now is way more interesting to the field. Um, at least to people that are making, you know, strides in it and not kind of stuck in this mainstream food pyramid model, which a lot of people still are. I mean, let's not make any mistake that the, what we're talking about is like, you know, a fraction of a percent of like the uh, people practicing like nutritionists and that type of thing. They're still getting their recommendations from kind of the, you know, mainstream organizations. The information that your people are able to get from these individual case studies is so interesting because like, just imagine a bell curve, right? A bell curve is designed to look at the average 50% of the population. And the truth is that there's actually no such thing as an average human being, right? Like the people on either end of that bell curve, even if, you know, you can figure out a diet that works for 50% of the people, you're still talking about 25% of the people out there that are going to respond differently. And you get uh, these responses in so many different domains that the idea of, you know, having something that's going to be kind of good across the board starts to become moot. I mean, like, like you said, there's certain things like eating less processed food, you know, drinking water, getting out in the sun, basic stuff is going to be good for people. Um, but when you start to talk about how, you know, if someone has compromised health and is working on, you know, really reversing disease or something, well, you really need to know how, you know, specifically these people are going to be impacted by all these things. So uh, I'm far more interested in, kind of the uniqueness of people than the average. And, you know, I, I think it's like uh, how to you can kind of tie it back to art again, like people that have broken the convention over time, like, you know, I'm just thinking about like, like the surrealists in the 1920s and like Dali and like people like that, that were like, yeah, we're not doing the impressionist stuff anymore. Like we're going to go and do weird shit. And then that forced the whole art world to take a look at it and be like, all right, there's these outliers here that are no longer paying attention to the mainstream. Like, how do we shift and, and change our thinking to match that style, to match that approach? And it's the same thing in, in the health world right now. Like, there's a lot of people who have realized, okay, this shit doesn't work that we've been doing. How, are, what are we going to do that's different and showing good results on these like small scale levels? And that's impacting the larger research community where they're like, okay, well, now that we have like at least some semblance of an idea from some renegade guy who was like, all right, I'm just going to see what happens if I eat a super high fat diet, you know, and lose weight. Like, that's weird. Let's see if we can study that further. You get these like little level ups of the outliers just trying new things. And it, and it's, it matches any type of evolution and thought, you know, you get people that just start thinking differently and, put their work out there and that you know, eventually filters into the way that um, kind of the whole crowd is thinking about it. And that's really, I think what's going to happen here with the nutrigenetic and nutrigenomic piece, because there's the people at the forefront right now, knowing that's kind of the edge. It's not even about what diet you use. It's a, it, it's about the genetics and the way that diets matched up. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's making me think about <laughs> I mean, specifically lately, I've seen a bunch of people go into the hospital, older people, and have a really bad time. Mm -hmm. And when I'm visiting them, I see the food that's brought to them. And I'm like, holy shit, you're giving this person with cancer a diet Dr. Pepper right now. What, <laughs> what is going on? So is the, 
as we move into a future that's possibly and very likely going to have a lot more automation and a lot more freedom for us as humans to do less labor intensive types of work, yet we'll still need to be productive to some degree to exist in society as long as we're playing Monopoly together. Do you think we'll see a rise in people doing what you do and sort of a mass exodus away from these one size fits all treatment centers called hospitals that seem to kill about one third of the people that go in there, whether or not it's obviously not on purpose, but you know, the approach that we've been taking for a hundred years is clearly not working. Do you think it's going to sort of splinter out and become smaller, but more widespread or what's the future that you see? Yeah, I don't know. And, and that's a really good question. I hope that there are more people doing this. And what we're seeing right now in the field is you have a lot of people that are turning away from the insurance model and going into private pay models for this type of thing, where they know that people want more personalized attention, personalized care. And the the really big issue, I think, is going to come down to how health insurance reimburses people for this and whether or not you know that system changes because that you know doctors hands are tied like doctors that are working and see you know having to see you know 30 people in a day and can only see them for 10 minutes well it's because that in order to get reimbursed by health insurance companies they have to do that and they have to see, you know, meet a certain minimum quota and there's they basically have no choice but to, to treat people in that way and uh, I mean, doctor suicide rates right now are insanely high. Like the people quitting that field is insanely high and burning out. And it's because that there is not a uh, way forward to actually give people the care they need in the mainstream. And ironically, that actually puts more of a health and stress strain on the ones that stay in the field because they're so either they, I guess, want to make the doctor salary or to a larger degree, probably people that actually want to find a way to help people and heal people, you know? And so now they're more stressed and more overworked because there's less to share the load. And then there's the whole medical school conundrum of (laughs) how few people are actually accepted to enter those fields. It's like a whole can of worms. Sorry to interrupt, but like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Oh no, go for it. Yeah, totally. And you know, and I think the important thing to recognize is like doctors get into this because they want to help people. Like there's no one out there that's like, Ooh, I'm going to see people for 10 minutes a day. That sounds amazing. Like it's just the, just the nature of the system. So it's more about shifting the underlying mentality of the system. And I am not an expert in, in that by any means, but I will say this, that, you know, in terms of looking at kind of the Western medical model, it's really good at treating acute short term things. Like if you break a bone, like they got you covered. If you have an infectious disease that you can eradicate with like an antibiotic, like pretty good at that. The real problem comes in when you're looking at long term health situations, because what's happened is they've taken the medical model. If you think about like, okay, turn of the, you know, uh, 19, you know, the 20th century, 1900s. Like they were basically focused on, all right, how can we um, get rid of uh, typhoid fever and malaria? Like all these things that were like just killing people off, right? And looking at infectious disease. And that approach to medicine is not the same approach that you want to use or that's effective to use when someone, um, you know, is looking to optimize their health or just prevent you know, decline or, or looking at things that creep up long-term like diabetes or, you know, cancer is the result of long-term lifestyle stuff. There's a genetic component, but it's really how you live your life and what you do that creates the conditions for something like that to, to come along. Heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, all these things that are, you know, kind of creeping up on us right now. It's largely because of the approach that's been taken from the mainstream medical model it doesn't, it, it, it's an outdated approach that's designed to be a treating acute simple things that you sh- you can just give someone a pill and you kill off the virus and it goes away or kill off the bacteria and it goes away. And there's a real disconnect um, between the way of thinking about these things as complex systems approach. Like the human body is this very complex system. And more often than not, you know, there's this reductionist model that gets applied to these things to just say, all right, how can we find the one thing that's going to take care of this. And most of the time, it, it doesn't work like that. Most of the time, it requires you know this uh, systems thinking approach that looks at all of the inputs into the human body and 
sees how they are synthesized and turned into a health promoting or health detracting state. And, you know, you can really kind of conceptualize it in that, you know, everything is information, right? The human body is incredibly good at figuring out what information is in the environment and responding to it. Like all of the things that we think of diseases, they're just adaptive responses to the wrong information being fed into the body. And so from an epigenetic perspective, an epigenetics um, is how your body responds to the environment in, in, ter- in, in relationship to the information that it's, it's getting. It, it turns on certain genetic genes. It turns down certain genes when it's presented with these certain environmental variables. When you start to look at the human body from the perspective of like, it's an information coagulating and synthesizing and responding machine, you really have to kind of level the playing field of like, okay, it's not just about nutrition. It's not just about exercise. It's not just about stress. It's not just about the air you're breathing or the sunlight you're getting or the electromagnetic signals that you're picking up from Wi-Fi or, you know, grounding beneath you. It's, it's a combination of all of those things. And that's really where epigenetics is taking us in terms of looking at the holistic picture of how uh, health is created or not in the body, you know? Yeah. And that epigenetics thing goes all the way to belief systems. Even that can have an impact on what your body decides to do. So uh, at the very least, say nice things to yourself. <laughs> like really that positive self-talk can actually change your DNA. And I've experienced it. And then you create that positive feedback loop that reinforces it. And all of a sudden you've got some uplift. What I think is probable for the future is definitely more guys like you where hopefully the model of how we approach our health can change from being that we pay someone when we're sick to try and fix us to we pay someone almost like a subscription model of health to help us stay optimally healthy all the time. And then, you know, that starts not working, then we go find someone else or we don't hire them anymore. I think that would really change the incentive in the system because even though many doctors probably do have the incentive to help people. Corporations have a mind of their own because they're this big data-driven machine that's larger than any one person. And at the end of the day, they answer to a board of investors that requires the profits to continue going up. So there is definitely an incentivized uh, keeping of people ill, whether or not that's any one person's particular personal intention. And yeah, I, I love what you're doing. I think You've got an awesome future of helping many people. It's really cool that your path actually took you here in that... I didn't really mention it, but that's an amazing synchronicity that the podcast you were into was just right next door and all that fell into place. It's, it's pretty wild. But I want to talk a little bit about cleansing and detoxing because that's been a big topic on the show lately and for me in my personal life. And I'm curious about some of the ways that nutrigenetics can inform us about the detox protocols and maybe enhance them. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I I think there's a lot of different things that people mean when they say detox and and detoxification. And there's a lot of different ways to to approach it. And, you know, my perspective on it is that the body is really good at detoxing things like on its own for the most part. Um, There is, you know, there's benefit to fasting, I think, pretty significantly, but, but its main benefits are not necessarily the detox piece, Uh, a lot of energy metabolism benefits. You know, the best things that I've found is to look at what are the detoxification molecules in the body? Uh, What are the very specific pathways that are in your body that are say in the liver or in other systems that are designed to help break things down, shuttle them out of the body and make sure that you're, you know, limiting your exposure internally to things that are harmful. And the, the nutrigenomic piece is really, really helpful for that because you can get very granular with those specific pathways. And so like, say for example, you know, if you take a, detox supplement or something that's designed for 
you know, general detox, it, you're not actually really targeting anything specific. You're doing a general kind of broad stroke thing, which is helpful. And it can be very helpful. You know, we're in an environment now where there's tons of shit we got to be aware of and, and keep out of our bodies. But when you're able to look at, okay, like here's different, here's, you know, eight different pathways in the liver. Like, for example, I look at the system in the liver called the P450 system. That's kind of the, the first pass of these enzymes that the liver produces. The first pass when a substance gets taken in your body, it starts to get broken down by those. And you can look at genetics and get a feel for it. Does someone produce more or less of that specific enzyme? And based on that, you can use certain herbs that are going to upregulate and boost the production of those enzymes. So for example, there's a, uh, a pathway called CYP1A2. And this has to do with how your body breaks down estrogen. It has to do with estrogen, caffeine, and melatonin. For whatever reason, those three things have, the, have an affinity to this enzyme. And so for someone who produces less of that enzyme, they might have estrogen detox issues. For women, that can translate into high risk of breast cancer higher uh, risk of like painful periods or, you know, increased PMS, that kind of thing. And for someone that doesn't metabolize caffeine well, caffeine is actually going to, and what the studies show is that it increases risk of heart attack, increases risk of high blood pressure. For someone who is a fast caffeine metabolizer and has a sufficient amount of enzyme, it is actually cardioprotective, prevents heart attack and stuff. But that's it's the opposite, depending on what your genotype is. But for example, if someone is a poor estrogen metabolizer, they can take a supplement called DIM or diendylmethane. Uh, that's an extract from cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cabbage and Brussels sprouts. And it nutrigenomically upregulates the expression of that gene. It turns on that gene. Like if you imagine like a dimmer switch on it, it just kind of like turns it up and kind of offsets some of that risk. And so from a from a detox perspective you can look at using genetics you can look at you know maybe 20 or 30 the 30 of these different pathways and go okay well this one's probably fine i don't really need to take anything for that like my body's doing it on its own but for this one and this one like yeah i can probably you know reduce reduce my inflammation risk reduce the risk of accumulating certain toxins by either knowing that I have kind of a deficiency there and avoiding certain things or taking herbs or certain nutrients that boost the function of those things. So does that answer your question? I think so. I mean, it's uh, basically what you're saying is it's freaking complicated, (laughs) (laughs) but that a, a lot of times a balanced diet, I think would help offset that if you're not actually going in and measuring your personal levels or exploring your genes. Sounds like it's a good idea to do both of those things, but that if you at least have an idea of getting sort of the full rainbow in your diet color wise, that's probably going to help. I imagine. Mm -hmm. Dude, thank you so much for this conversation. I say this a lot, but this has got to be one of the most fun ones for me because uh, I learned a lot. And it's one that I'll actually, I know for a fact that like two years from now, I'll go back and listen to this and be like, okay, what does he say? I got to go look into this. And like, (laughs) and I didn't even necessarily get to all my questions. So but I got all the ones that I think were relevant for the talk today. And maybe in the future, we can do this again. But thank you for being here. And, you know, I'd love to give you the floor as long as you'd like to wrap up any threads that may have been left hanging loose and also tell people where to connect with you and give them the invitation to come work with you. Because I, I would love to see some of the audience evolve and expand through the very scientific but also, in my opinion, quite spiritually aligned work that you're doing. It's super impressive, man. Yeah, man. Well, yeah, it's been a super pleasure to talk to you. Really dug all of the uh, threads of the conversation. You know, I guess the final thing I, I'd, I'd say is, um, you know, just let curiosity kind of lead you to where it takes you. That's as far as I'm concerned, how I've gotten here and uh, just being open to those possibilities that show up, I think is super important. But if anyone wants to get in contact with me and learn more about what I'm doing, uh, my website is david krantz K-R-A-N-T-Z dot com. And for anyone that's interested and uh, you know really looking to uplevel their health and uh, you know kind of get a handle on what it is they need to do to f- to function optimally, um, if you're looking for more energy, your focus, or just you know really trying to be the best 
person you can be physically to impact the, the, the mental and emotional things. Um, I offer free 30 minute consultations uh, to see if we're a good fit to work together and kind of give you more information about how uh, my services work and learn a little bit more about you. So yeah, if you're interested, you can go to david And uh, other than that, yeah, I've got a, uh, you know, some articles on there. And like you mentioned at the beginning, I've got a um, full webinar recording of how your genes impact your response to cannabis. Uh, so, you know, plenty of stuff to learn and, and check out. And yeah. And by the way, if you, if you want to look at your genes, you know, be happy to do some work with you too. And, and maybe we could come back and do an episode where we talk about what you learned or something like that. Oh, that'd be cool, man. Okay. Let's do it. That's a good, uh, motivation for me to take the plunge into this heavy data world of <laughs> self-optimization and biohacking, which I've only kind of skirted around the edges of, I mean, I've done a lot of optimizing of my health through steps around diet and exercise and, you know, the glasses we talked about, but, and there's a lot of little things I've done, but the next level, as you put it, is really crunching the numbers on that 1%, less than 1% that makes you unique. And that uniqueness is so vast because what's 1% of infinity? It's still, <laughs> still infinity. <laughs> Yeah, totally, man. And, and you know, I, I think there's kind of a uh, somewhat of a misconception about the kind of the biohacking world because so much of it has come from like the Silicon Valley elite and CEOs trying to be like squeeze the last little bit out of their their day so they can squeeze more profit out of this and and that. But like, I really love taking those techniques and giving them to the people that I think really deserve it and people that are interested in creating a better world and creating, you know, just more goodness in themselves and other people. And it's just easier to do that when you've got all the techniques at your disposal. So modern day Robin Hood, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's wrap this up, dude. Uh, let you get back to your day. I know that there's got to be plenty of people ready for your divine attention. And it's been a blast. Thanks, everybody. opinion, good people, that is what you would call a fantastic podcast episode. No doubt David is a professional podcast guest, at least it seems to me. He's been on a lot of shows and clearly has listened to a lot of shows. And he's great at keeping that flow of conversation in interesting waters. Not to mention just the subject matter itself is beyond fascinating. I mean, I feel that we're in the future now, if we're talking about this genetic stuff, being able to unlock our unique superpowers and learning how to mitigate our kryptonites as well, I feel like this is definitely comic book land for someone like me that's been a sci-fi nerd my whole life. I'd often hear about, you know, mad scientists doing genetic experiments and creating this or that in whatever superhero story. But for some reason, I, I was too lost in the imagination or whatever to even think about, well, when's that going to happen for me? Not the mad scientist part or becoming a half human, half pig man thing, man bear pig, but the uh, optimization of my health through science. You know, we hear about all this stuff that science is doing this, science is doing that, research and studies and yada, yada, yada. But if we're not the ones participating in that stuff, when does it come home to us? And a lot of times, I guess it's when there's some technology or product. But when it comes to learning about ourself, typically that's not been something technology can help us do. It was more up to our awareness and our ability to log our 
personal information and get a data history and understand patterns in ourselves. And now it's practically like you can just send off some spit to these people and you get what would have taken an amazing amount of discipline and study by yourself to figure out, you know, how this affects me, how I feel after that in research and logging all of it and categorizing the information and studying it about yourself. They can do that type of thing for you in like practically no time, relatively speaking. So it kind of feels like cheating, but it's really interesting and I'm going to do it for sure. David offered to let me, Good. Uh, his services in a one-time special offer, podcast host, a special offer, lucky me. And it is pretty cool to think about doing a round two conversation with him where we discuss what makes my particular DNA what it is. Pretty, pretty intriguing all around. And I'll make sure that it's actually a good podcast conversation uh, when we do that and have plenty of questions ready. Like specifically... One thing that's just coming in my head right now I'd really like to ask him about is what is what are your thoughts on what I see as kind of the inevitable future where this genetic research turns back towards genetic or eugenics like it has already been doing in earlier parts of the last hundred years. What happens then? Because <laughs> there is a certain amount of people in the Western nations, especially that seem to be okay with going closer and closer towards like a fascism feel. And then others that are more cool with like a socialism, government controls everything feel. And to me, either side of the right or left in the current political extremism that is happening, they're both basically signing up for a different form of totalitarianism. And if we have a totalitarian future ahead of us, it is a little concerning to think what may or may not be done in the name of genetic, let's see, uh, sanity or sanitation of the population, <laughs> keeping certain people from being able to easily reproduce is, according to some conspiracy researchers, already happening. And that a lot of the onslaught of toxicity we see in our current environment and world all over the place is actually a veiled attempt at eugenics where, you know, this isn't, I'm not saying this is what I think, but there, I think there is some evidence to support that certain individuals at least have had this viewpoint in the uh, millionaire billionaire class, which is that, you know, the poor people are in a social Darwinian sense, not as <laughs> valuable or have genetically their, less valuable or even undesirable than the controller class or the so-called elites. So I wanted to talk to David about that question. Like, what, do you see an inevitable future in the eugenics uh, movement? Or do you see that people are too smart for that? And yeah, I mean, that's a can of worms too. <laughs> so that's why I didn't crack it on him in this conversation. We had already kind of covered everything that I could fit into it. But I was thinking about it and I'm definitely interested in bringing that up. If you are wanting more of this chat and you're not already aware of Universe Plus, you can get the second hour of the conversation by becoming a member on Patreon forward slash patreon.com forward slash Interverse. Support the podcast you love, get extra episode content, tons of stuff in the archives. And this time in the plus extension, we talked about the genetic differences in response to psychedelics and plant medicines per individual, biofeedback and strengthening the mind-body connection, paying attention to the sonic environment to upgrade your awareness, ideas for mitigating the epigenetic consequences of rising EMF levels, sun gazing superhumans and the light body biohacking strategies for perfecting your circadian rhythms, binaural beats and brainwave entrainment technology, the inspiration behind David's newest album as Few Texture, and a detour to talk about the epic novel Dune, one of my favorite books. So all that and more in the plus extension, I think probably the most interesting stuff in there and some useful information that you could leverage in your biohacking quest if you haven't already been researching the biohacking community and already know 
maybe some tricks, but I haven't done a lot of research in that world yet. So whenever I hear cool tricks and biohacks from someone like David, like we had in this plus extension, I tend to be pretty impressed and think, wow, there's probably a lot in that universe that I should dive in and start exploring. And maybe I will. I'm going to start with getting this epigenetic coaching session from David and big, big thanks to him for reaching out to come on the show. It's pretty exciting for me because I realized I had actually heard him before on a show that I like, Third Eye Drops, and he's been on lots of others. Like I said, he's kind of a professional podcast guest amongst many other things that he is a pro at. And like I just brought up, Few Texture, his newest album is quite interesting and very textured indeed. You could compare it to like a Tipper-esque, glitchy, but still got melodic elements and there's just it's just weird electronic music okay like what what are we trying to put genres on everything interestingly too the word genre has got the same root as genes and it means a similar thing the genre of the music is like it's genetics <laughs> so go check out few texture on soundcloud f-u-t-e-x-t-e-r-e Definitely a genetic hybrid, if there ever was one, or gener generic hybrid, I guess, would be the proper terminology, but really cool. And the newest album that he's put out actually has uh, proceeds going towards indigenous land rights in Ecuador, and I believe has already made a positive impact through EP sales or album sales or whatever. Uh, you know, people buying it on Bandcap, obviously don't go to Walmart and buy a CD anymore. But if you send David some money and say, this is for the fight in Ecuador, or you purchase his newest album through one of the ways of purchasing it, probably like iTunes and all over the place, you're going to be helping out a good cause and props to the man for making a big difference in the world with music, with teaching people about their health and Probably in his daily life, he's probably a pretty cool guy to know if you're his friend or his family member. I bet he helps you move even if he doesn't really want to. He just seems like a really nice guy. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much, David. And really enjoyed this episode. Hope to talk to you again soon. And to all of you out there in the audience land, thank you for being with me here on Interverse. I'm going to play us out with a song by Few Texture off of that new album. And don't forget, you can, if you're new to the show, you can subscribe to it on any podcast playing app or channel that you can think of that it would be on. It's almost certainly there. There's maybe a couple exceptions. So you could be on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, Spotify, the iTunes podcast app, all over the place. And if you so happen to want to share this episode or any other just to do me a great big favor and getting the word out that we do this here fun time called Interverse. I'd love that. So thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you're learning a lot about yourself and making positive evolution that sticks. But I'm done for now. Off to go play outside, as David suggested, in the sunlight. Go figure. Sunlight is good for us. I'm doing my best to get out in it and hope you are too. Hope you're loving your August. I love you. Talk to you soon.